We continue with a look at the skeleton and the appendicular skeleton now. And so everything that is tan is now part of the appendicular skeleton. All the green portion was part of the axial skeleton. So we'll now look at the limbs and the pectoral and pelvic girdles. So starting up at the pectoral girdle, we have our scapula. And so the scapula itself has an anterior, a medial, and a lateral, and a posterior side to it. And so the anterior view being here on the left, we have a subscapular fossa, which contains the entire space on the anterior side. This is conversed with the posterior part of the scapula, which has a spine running down the center, which then opens up into the acromion or the acromial process. And that spine is going to serve as a boundary for our supraspinous fossa, which is all the space in here, and then our infraspinous fossa, so all the space that's below the spine itself. And so that serves as the border between each of those structures that are there. That acromion then is truly more of kind of a, a superior structure in a sense in that it rolls up onto the top of the scapula itself. And so we'll see that more on the, the top side. On the anterior portion, we have the coracoid process here. So this is gonna stick out anteriorly. As we look at it from the side view, we can see again the supraspinous fossa and then the infraspinous fossa. Both of those will be filled in by muscles later on. And then we have the subscapular fossa right in there as well for the structures that we can see. We again have the acromion or the acromion process. We have the coracoid process. We can now see the glenoid cavity so we have the glenoid cavity here. This is essentially the socket portion to the ball and socket joint of the shoulder, as we see it there. And then from a superior view, we can now see the acromion once again, and we can see where it's going to articulate with the clavicle. And so the clavicle has two sides to it. It has the acromial end, and then it has the sternal end. Those two different portions there is easier to see in person in that the acromial end is kind of flat. And then the sternal end, when we look at it on end, is more rounded. And so it looks more like a, a rounded structure than anything else when we look at it from the side there. And that's because the acromial side is going to have to articulate with the acromion itself which is a flattened out structure as well. So it stands the reason following the form and function format that the two are going to look a lot like one another when we see them. So from there we have our humerus and the humerus has the head of the humerus. So the rounded kind of ball portion there. This is the part that's going to articulate with the glenoid cavity itself. Just off of the head of the humerus, we then have the neck right in there. And so where it tapers down, we have the neck there. This is different from the two bumps that we have here in that we have the greater tubercle and then the lesser tubercle. So that's an anterior structure there. And in between the tubercles, we then have the intertubercular groove or sulcus. And so that lies just in between the two structures that are there as well. As we move down the humerus on the lateral side, right about in here, we're going to have the deltoid tuberosity. And so it's gonna be kind of a roughened area. It almost looks like a V on the, the side of the humerus there, as we see it. From there we have, we go down to the distal end of the humerus. And we now have a little depression here. And this depression is going to be used for part of the ulna actually pushing into it. And so this is now our coronoid fossa. It's going to receive the coronoid process when the elbow bends into flexion. 
And so we'll see it start to, to open up into there as well. From there, we have the epicondyles. And so we have the lateral and the medial epicondyles on either side there. And then we start to put it together with the ulna. We have the coronoid process here, which was going to go into that fossa. And then we have the olecranon process here, which then goes into the olecranon fossa on the humerus. That's there. Um, some other structures that we can see here as well. Uh, on the radius, we have the head. We have the radial tuberosity. Both bones have a styloid process on there as well. Where the two of them articulate with one another, we have a notch. And so where the radial head is making contact with the ulna there, there's a little depression on the ulna called the radial notch. And then down at the distal end, we have another depression, this time in the radius, called the ulnar notch. So that's where the, the ulna is going to articulate with the radius at the distal end. A close-up of the proximal region of the ulna. So we have our olecranon process, we have our coronoid process. Here we can now see that radial notch, and so the radial notch is this space in here. You can see it again on this side here. So the radial notch there. This groove, in a sense, that's here, the U-shaped portion that's there on the ulna, is the trochlear notch. And so it's essentially in between the olecranon process and the coronoid process that's there. And so the ulna, in a sense, has a built-in U for determining which bone you're looking at. The radius then articulates with the wrist. And so when we look at the hand and wrist here, we have three different sets of bones. And so we have the carpals. So we have eight small bones here. We then have the metacarpals. We have five bones there. That makes up primarily the wrist region. And then we have our phalanges, the fingers, on there for those. And so if we look at them kind of close up, and we'll start to work our way back in towards the wrist from the fingers. So on the digits, we number them starting with the thumb, and we go towards the pinky, and we have one, two, three, four, five. So we've got five different digits. Each one has a proximal phalanx, and so the proximal phalanx there. Each of the bones has a distal phalanx, those ones there, but the thumb there is missing a middle phalanx. And so each of the digits two through five has a middle phalanx, but the first digit does not. The thumb does not have a middle phalanx there. So we don't have all three bones in the thumb. The metacarpals are labeled the same way. And so one, two, three, four, and five for each one of the, the metacarpals there. And then the carpals each have their own name. And so there's many different mnemonics that you can go out and find on the internet in different places to memorize the names of the bones. Uh, but each one has its own individual name. And I like to start on the thumb side and we'll start in the first row. So there's four bones in each row. And so I'll just highlight these here are the proximal bones. And then these here are the distal row of four bones that are there for each one. So in naming them, we then have the scaphoid, 
we have the lunate, we have the triquetrum, and then the pisiform. The pisiform actually sits on top of the triquetrum or the triquetral bone. And so it's going to be more anterior than that of the triquetral, or it's, or it's more superficial than that of the triquetrum. That's there. So it does sit on top. And so the pisiform is basically here. And then the triquetrum is here. And so the two bones are stacked on top of one another. This is the bone that you can feel kind of at the the pinky side of the wrist right at the wrist crease that's that little bump that you feel there we come back to the thumb side and so this is the first metacarpal so this now becomes the trapezium and i'm going to put a um there so kind of tum and then right next door we have the trapezoid and then right in the middle we have capitate and then we have hamate going across there and so scaphoid lunate triquetrum pisiform trapezium trapezoid capitate hamate as we go through all of the carpals themselves and as i said you can find some different mnemonics out there if you'd like to be able to utilize for those bone down to the lower extremities and so we have our pelvis here and so the pelvis or the os coxa um, individually we have two separate bones in terms of the adult and so we have one half here and then the other half over here sitting in the center we then have the sacrum so that kind of locks the, the vertebral column into the pelvis itself. Lying in between the two sides of the pelvis here, we have some connective tissue. So we have fibrocartilage there. This is the symphysis pubis. And where the symphysis pubis makes contact on either side, we have the symphyseal surface of the pubic bones that are there and so when we go through the pelvis uh, there are a number of different structures to find on there and so we can look through the structures that are there and we have essentially the ilium We have the ischium, and then we have the pubis. So three separate bones that fuse together to give us the structures that are there for the pelvis itself. And then within that, we have some structures that we can see on the pelvis as well. And so we have the iliac crest. We have the posterior superior iliac spines we have the posterior inferior iliac spines we have the greater sciatic notch we have the ischial spine we have the ischial tuberosity and this is essentially the part that you sit on when you're sitting we then have the pubic arch We have the obturator foramen. And then we have the depression here is the acetabulum. And so we have the structures that we can see on the bones themselves. The femur is going to articulate with the acetabulum at the femoral head. And so we have the head of the femur. We then have the neck of the femur. We have the greater trochanter and the lesser trochanter. We can see those same structures from a posterior view. So here's our greater trochanter, lesser trochanter, 
neck, and head. Running along the posterior side of the femur, along the lower part here, we have the linea aspera. Then we get down to the distal end. On the anterior side, we have the patellar surface. So it's kind of a roughened area that's there. We have the adductor tubercle. We then have the condyles. And so we have a medial condyle and the lateral condyle on either side there. And then we can take a close up view of the femur as well. And you'll notice that in the head of the femur here, there's a little depression. This little depression is the fovea capitis. Right inside there. We then have the patella. So the patella sits on that patellar surface and we come down and we have the apex of the patella. And then at the top, you have the base of the patella. And so the, the base is at the top and the apex is down below. The femur and those condyles are going to sit on top of the tibia right in here. So we have the tibial condyles as well. Some structures we'll be able to see better when we look at a close up here in just a moment. Uh, on the anterior side of the tibia, there's a little bump here called the tibial tuberosity. In some people, this is really very prominent. So they have a very large one because they may have had Osgood Schlatter's when they were younger. And that caused that tibial tuberosity to grow and grow and grow and grow on there. The tibia has a medial malleolus. The fibula has a lateral malleolus. That sits right there on either side. The fibula then has a head as well. A little close up of the tibia and the fibula here. And so again, we have the condyles. And in between those two condyles, we have the intercondylar eminences, two little points that stick up there. We can also see now that bump of the tibial tuberosity and appreciate that a little bit more. We have the, again, the medial malleolus and the lateral malleolus. So those are the two bumps that you normally associate with being your ankle, uh, the two little sides there on either side of your ankle. Um, the things that you tend to bump into things at times. Uh, those are the structures that actually stick out on either side. They are going to grab onto the ankle bones. And so this is similar to what we had up in the hand. And so now instead of carpals, though, we're going to have tarsals. We then have metatarsals. And then we once again have phalanges that are there. And so since we're near the toes, that means that we're dealing with tarsals. So your T's kind of go together with one another. Once again, we name the toes based upon their position. So starting with the big toe, we have number one, two, three, four, and five for the digits. And once again, there is a proximal and a distal bone. And so all five have a proximal, all five have a distal. And then once again, only digits two through five have a middle phalanx. And so we only have the, the middle one there on digits two through five once again. The metatarsals again are named one, two, three, four, and five. And then lastly, in this region, we have two bones on the underside of the big toe, and these are sesamoid bones. And so these are similar to the patella in that they lie within tendons, and so they're embedded into a tendon. And then we have our tarsals. And so we have the talus here, 
It sits on top of the calcaneus. In front of the calcaneus, we have the cuboid. In front of the talus, we have the navicular. And then in front of the navicular, we have three bones. And so we have three separate cuneiforms. And so these three cuneiforms are either our medial, intermediate, and lateral for the three bones there. We can also see a little bit better from the side here. And so once again, we have the talus. So this is what the tibia sits on top of. We have the calcaneus. We have the cuboid, the navicular, and then we can see our three cuneiforms here. Here's the lateral, there's the intermediate, and we just barely see the medial one there, the cuneiform on there. So here's the navicular, and then here's that medial cuneiform as well. The talus and the calcaneus. And then we have all of our metatarsals and then a little bit of the tarsals there visible as well. And that concludes our look at the bones of the skeleton.